I'm honored to be the moderator of this distinguished panel uh, of my classmates and uh, the dean of faculty. And what we're going to do is first hear from uh, Ted Rosengarten, followed by Larry Mead and Paul Diamond, then Catherine Epstein. Uh, we're, we're talking um, today, I hope everyone's arrived who's going to be here. We're going to talk about the role of race and ethnicity uh, in our past and future and how it's uh, impacting the world and uh, Amherst College. Ted, can you hear me? That's a definite no. <laughs> Uh, uh, great. Uh, well, hello, friends. Yeah, you're this. Is this working? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Coming through. So, uh, this is Ted Rosenbach, and I'm with my colleague, Deirdre Douglas Hubbard. And we're speaking from the belly of the beast, Boston, South Carolina. And um, Sam? Yes. You're directing this panel. I asked a question. What have you been doing lately, Ted? <laughs> I understand. You know what I've been doing? Yes. I understand you've been traveling. Living, teaching, and working as a community activist in South Carolina for 40 years. How many years? Uh, <laughs> really? I understand you've been traveling in Europe lately, is that right? Yeah, um, I just came back from leading a study abroad, a tour with uh, students from the College of Charleston and University of South Carolina to Ukraine, Poland, and Germany. It's a continuation of courses that I teach on the Holocaust. Uh, it was incredibly got it late last night. It was incredibly intense and fabulous trip. We visit um, schools, institutes, the sites of former death camps, and we meet with uh, some great scholars across Europe. Ted, what what have you? Uh, what's the purpose of these trips that you take? I think the purpose of the trip is to give people a, uh, essentially a visceral feeling for the past. You know, in, in some places, the past disappears very quickly. In other places, particularly in uh, Ukraine and Poland, uh, what happened, well, certainly the narrative of what happened a uh, half century ago and more is still contested, and we get to both witness listen and take part in some of the debates of that test. So it's a very active trip. Not enough, not enough time on, for, on our own of sightseeing. Um, uh, lots of interaction with um, uh, the students, with young people like themselves who are asking some of the same questions. And Deirdre, who's with me here, Deirdre has um, been to Poland twice with us. I say with us because my wife Dale is a co-leader of the trip. And uh, Deirdre now, um, what's the name of the organization? Works for an organization called MVFR, which is Murder Victims for Reconciliation. And that organization will have some role, we hope, in uh, determining the, uh, whether or not the death penalty will be imposed in the upcoming trials of uh, the young man who shot and killed the nine parishioners at AME, at Emmanuel, Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston last year. 
in which we all lost friends. Has that come through? Yes. Yes, that's fine. Um, I, I was wondering, Ted, what do you see as a connection between your trips to Europe and to the concentration camps and what was happening at the AME Church in South Carolina, if any? I think I'm going to give one answer, I think Dave can give an answer too. I think we are, we're talking about people who are, people who we are studying for the victims of racism in one form or another. Um, and we know that the racial ideology of the National Socialist Movement in, um, in Germany uh, developed through exchange with uh, racial activists in the United States. Uh, of course, there are some, you know, the differences may be more profound than the uh, likenesses, but even today, to hear people talk in Europe, about people who are victimized by the Nazis, people who are being um, subjected right now to uh, terrible disabilities, the, uh, particularly the refugees from uh, Africa and from the Middle East. Uh, in fact, one of the schools you visited the, in Berlin, the gymnasium of the school was housing some 400 refugees from Syria. And to hear many people on the streets talking about them uh, brought me back to how people had talked, uh, I heard people talk about African Americans uh, many years ago right here. But let me, let me ask uh, Deirdre that same question about what the connection is between kind of the work we do now around race and the study of the racial catastrophe all the whole of us. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. I would say that it's so many parallels between African American history and Jewish history. Um, that's one of the reasons I've chosen to focus on it so much because of the parallel um, intolerance, um, oppression, just everything, the law, the laws that were put into place. But as far as, I mean, Europe is definitely. A, a very far ahead of us in commemorating what their role in the Holocaust. But as far as in the States, we really, the discussion of race and basically this country being built on slavery, I mean, it's not talked about enough. But thankfully, you're getting to that point. Um, Charles and I hope with the trial coming up and everything that happened, we're definitely open to talking about it so maybe we can do some restorative justice. Um, and that is one of the one of the many things that goes with Jewish history, I think, and mother, I mean, Holocaust victims and mother Emanuel victims. You know, we, we didn't talk much about race at Amherst. We didn't talk at all about what we now call the Holocaust. It was a totally absent subject. And it does take um, this passing of time that makes it um, comfortable for us uh, to begin to have discussions. Uh, I've understood in, in the, my time here at Amherst and subsequently that what the nation needed in order to become more uh, more of a United States of America um, was a conversation in which topics were openly discussed and uh, prejudices were confronted and that we would get over uh, some of the problems uh, that resulted from people talking less and smiling more and not confronting the issues. Uh, do you think this sort of comparison with uh, Nazi Germany and the other countries overtaken by the Nazis helps get beyond the prejudice that people talk about privately but 
not publicly, that people don't confront, uh, and therefore they're not changing their attitudes, but just concealing them? You know, we, uh, I, I think for me one of the big surprises and that for all people who were connected to the player and other with the movement to end discriminatory law, that once, once the laws were abolished that enforced separation that kept people, kept, that applied assets of the state for one group and, and kept them away from the other, uh, that what we terribly underestimated was the injury that centuries of slavery and Jim Crow and various unofficial oppressions have had on people. So that, you know, the simply abolishing discriminatory law has not created an even playing field. So Sam, I think the question is what, how do we get to that next, how do we get to that uh, leveling? What, what, what do we do next? Um, I'm a, a great believer in uh, education and education starting very, very early and have worked hard in my little community. Um, but I see that the kind of circle of the areas of, uh, that you have to keep fighting. Yeah? Once, once we may work to reform a series of schools in a community, but the next generation, next parents of the children coming up have to continue that work. That somehow it's the, the institutional structure uh, is in a way oppressive in itself. Um, and we have not found, I think, a way to uh, overcome that. And I think part of the work also that uh, Deirdre is doing now uh, with her organization is to think of how we, how we move on, how we move ahead. Well, I'd like uh, to, you to join in as we discuss with the other panelists uh, what they're here to discuss today. So please uh, speak up if you have something to say. I'm going to I'm going to turn. Oh, here's the panelist. <laughs> I'm going to turn to Larry B now, and Larry has uh, written about welfare reform uh, in many contexts. And he's written several books on the subject, one of which was uh, Government Matters. And uh, I would like you, Larry, to address the subject sure. of your writings and sure. your thinking on uh, the race relations. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I've been exchanging emails with classmates on some of these issues in the last few days, and uh, I'm glad we can now discuss them directly. These emails have sent a, a certain shiver through me when I see yet again, yet again, how enormously articulate the class is on whatever it decides to address. And I, can, I feel now, as I did 50 years ago, that this is the most awesome group of which I have ever been a member. It's, it's an honor that I never get over. And merely to have survived it is uh, an achievement. <clears throat> uh, let me speak principally about race and poverty. The uh, question is, why do we have these divisions about these questions, and will they get better or, first in, uh, better or worse in future? Uh, I think the d divisions are bound to be serious in the short term, but I'm optimistic that they'll improve over time. Uh, as you'll see, my perspective is quite different from, from Ted's, uh, but it's quite constructive, I think, to, to think about why. Uh, I approach these questions from a cultural viewpoint that I'm developing in a book I'm writing now about, really about the nature of America. Uh, I think the race and poverty questions have many causes and possible cures, but uh, serious poverty, lasting for more than a few years, is due mostly, in my view, to a difference in cultural background between the mainstream society and the minority groups that make up most of the seriously poor. That means blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans in particular. Mainstream society was formed mostly by people who came from Europe and brought with them an individualist culture where people pursue personal goals by seeking to change the world outside of them. Amherst, by the way, is an extreme expression of that mentality. 
when I read over the bios from our class, what I see is enterprising individuals doing what uh, St. Paul called working out their salvation in fear and trembling. Uh, we are finding our direction in life inner-driven, pursuing our own goals and interests. That is the Western style. America has that more strongly than any other country. And it is exceptional. This is not normal. Most of the world uh, has quite another view. I know some of you resist the idea that we're exceptional. I assure you, we are. The number of people in the world who live this way uh, is a minor, very small share of all of humanity. The minorities, however, come from a largely non-Western cultures where few people pursue personal goals in this way and most rather adapt to their environment as best they can. That includes most of the world, Latin America, Africa, Asia, all of them in various ways. They have a lot of differences. They're distinctive and important cultures, well worthy of study and experience, but they don't do what the West does. Most people in those societies adjust to the world rather than seeking to realize personal goals. Uh, and when people come from these countries to America, according to various studies, they generally continue in survival mode for several generations. They do not immediately convert to the individualism of the mainstream society. That's been true for blacks, who of course were long kept in survival mode by slavery and Jim Crow, but slavery and Jim Crow did not create the essentially reactive, passive quality of most of black America. That comes, that comes from Africa. And, and, and they were brought to America in part because they had that temperament. And that allowed them to be made into slaves on the plantations. Uh, of course, it, slavery is a terrible thing. It should have been abolished, was abolished. But it doesn't mean that right after that, you can expect black America to immediately uh, behave in an individualist manner. That's not likely to happen. Uh, Latin America, Asia, where most of our recent immigrants are coming from, they're the same way. These, these are societies given over to mostly to survival, to adjustment. Uh, not to uh, individualized pursuit of goals. So most people from outside the West, when they come to America, do not immediately make full use of the opportunities that America offers, because those opportunities presume an individualist mentality. And which is simply not the case for many of those coming to us today. I'm not saying it's their fault, it's nobody's fault, uh, but it's simply the way of life that they're coming from. And that is, I think, the basic reason why we have these deep divisions. However, over time, all these groups have gradually become more individualist as they've taken on the individualist style of the mainstream culture. That's what we see particularly among blacks who've been here the longest. The black elite, the leadership groups, uh, have become as individualist as anybody else. They've taken on the mainstream style. They've gone native. Uh, and my black associates uh, are exactly like me. They are inner-driven, they are pursuing their personal goals, and they are accomplished. Uh, that is, that's the final solution. That's where we should end up. But the rest of minority America also has to do that. They have to take on the style of the individualism. And that's not easy. Uh, the book I'm writing, the, the, word, the title is Burdens of Freedom. And indeed, freedom does involve burdens, uh, special requirements and obligations that go with being free. We are in the essence of freedom. That's why it's hard to be an individualist. So in the short term, I think continued controversy is unavoidable. Society does accept considerable responsibility for overcoming the problems of poverty and race, uh, although uh, many of our classmates would like it to do more than it does. I realize that some of us think we're not doing enough. We can discuss that. I, but the idea that we should be a social responsibility is above question. No one is questioning that seriously. Uh, some people think Donald Trump is questioning it. I'm not sure about even Trump, but anyway, the Republican Party as a whole, I assure you, does not question this. Uh, they, as much as Democrats and liberals, are uh, uh, committed to finding a solution. They disagree about how to do it, but they definitely accept the responsibility. But whatever is done for minorities, these groups and their spokesmen will go on asserting that there are further barriers that prevent them from getting ahead. That's because they're used to assigning power out here to the environment rather than in here to their own goals. And whatever situation they're put in, it seems to them as if that's the result of the environment, not anything they did. That is something that's coming to them from outside. And the mere fact that the environment is more generous does not change that basic assumption. Only a little over a month ago, I came to Amherst to give a talk on immigration. Now, given what I've written about poverty and welfare, it, it seemed to me inconceivable that the college or the faculty would ever invite me to come here. 
Uh, it was out of the question. So this, uh, this invitation came from, actually from the Amherst Political Union. So I came and I gave a talk about immigration. Uh, but what was interesting was I met several black and Hispanic students who'd come to the college due to its present emphasis on diversifying its admissions to bring in less privileged students. These were very impressive students, and I praised them for that. But what was interesting was they rejected my praise. They did not believe they had done anything. They gave the college all the credit for giving, giving them this special opportunity. They could not believe that they would have succeeded otherwise. They were looking, they were, they were praising society for having opened the doors to them. Whereas to me, they were outstanding and they would succeed in any event. It, it wasn't really so critical that Amherst had opened a door to them. But they were quite sure society was in charge. So that if these very gifted students continue to believe themselves dependent on the wider society, how much more will average black and Latino youth continue to believe this? So I think in the short term, the complaints will go on. For not to complain would make these groups responsible for their condition, and that is right now a burden that they cannot imagine. That is one of the burdens of freedom, is to be responsible for yourself. They don't accept that yet. In spite of all their gifts, they still think the society is in charge. But over time, I believe things will improve as more minorities take on the individualist lifestyle. They will find that they can handle America and its burdens without getting special attention. Their focus will then shift from rights and claims to obligations and responsibilities. That's the life that most of us have lived in this room. They will, in fact, find that freedom consists largely of obligations. And finally, that freedom itself actually is a form of obligation. Now, as I put it in some of my writings, those who would be free must first be bound. And we at Amherst, before Amherst, and through Amherst, and after Amherst, we were supremely bound by our inner goals, our other responsibilities. And it was those burdens that made us free. So I believe that the life our class has lived is the life where minorities are headed. They're going to do the same thing, but it's going to take them a while to get there. Thank you. You know, I, that's real interesting, because I, I remember as a student at Amherst, who was a upperclassman, Fred Richardson. Uh, he and I went out just before uh, some homecoming event, and we went to motels in the area, and uh, I would go first, and I would be told that uh, there's no room for my parents because they're sold out. And I go to the car, where Fred was, <laughs> Fred King went in, and they said, sure, when, when can your parents be here? When will they be here? And we took it to the Massachusetts Commission on Discrimination, uh, and uh, the owner of the motel was Polish, and the representative at the commission was Polish. And he told us that we have to work harder and we would be accepted after we were in the country a longer period of time. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, this system's rigged. I'm not going to waste any more time going any further. Um, and I don't know if he still owns the motel, um, but I do know that those struggles, uh, those struggles are still going on. I know because I represent some of the people who are struggling. Some of those people who, unlike what Larry suggests, uh, went through slavery, which he didn't, or his ancestors didn't, and went through Jim Crow, and went through <laughs> discrimination, and that discrimination hasn't ended yet. And their efforts on progressing are informed by a belief that the reason they're succeeding is because there are good natured people out there helping. And they are up against the big tidal wave of good ideology or questionable ideology, good meaning maybe, but that allows progress when there are good people out there assisting. Um, and you do have to assert yourself. You do have to study hard. You do have to benefit from the assistance of people whom I benefited from when I was at Amherst. And uh, to think that it's just a personal problem and that education is going to make the difference 
is to deceive yourself. <laughs> but that's just one point of view. Um, Paul Diamond is our next speaker. And uh, Paul has uh, quite a bio. And I only. We can skip that. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't hold down a job. <laughs> <laughs> he's had many good jobs, and he's been very creative. Um, he was a law clerk for federal judges, for a federal judge on the Court of Appeal after graduating from uh, Michigan Law School. Um, he also joined the Harvard Center for Law and Education in 1970, where he helped recruit Marion Wright Edelman. I don't know how many know her, but she is a very powerful woman, and she, she is black. And uh, she, she and Paul helped form the uh, Children's Defense Fund. And Paul helped pioneer the right to an education for every child in every state. And no state allowed to be left out of the effort. He's been in private practice in Ann Arbor and director of the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Uh, under law in DC. Um, uh, for a good period of time, he has been advocating um, that racial ghettoization of schools in metropolitan areas uh, can be uh, improved uh, and that empowering every family with an opportunity and a responsibility to choose uh, publicly supported schools that their parents decide will best help the children. From 93 to 97, he served as special assistant to President Clinton for the economic policy at the National Economic Council, including with the Metropolitan sorry, with respect to metropolitan economies, distressed communities and uh, markets for housing, labor, and education. Uh, I know he can go on, and I could go on and on about his qualifications, but I'd let him take it from here. So my speaking will disprove any of that. <laughs> I feel like uh, Aaron Latham, the, you know, here I am 72, and I quit practicing about that. Uh, a few too many years ago, so my, what was it, he felt like jello? Well, that, that's how I am, so you'll, you'll forgive me, but I want to take on the toughest issue. I want to pose a question to you about whether the four million black males who essentially have given, are in a lifetime of peonage because they've been convicted of drug offenses of one kind or another, use and possession. And as a result of the war on drugs beginning in uh, 1980, these four million black males uh, whether or not, in fact, they are not just the latest uh, undercast uh, in our society. And I take this on as the toughest issue because they are convicted criminals. And I want to, I majored in history, so uh, many of you know all about the constitutional debates about who, you know, originalists and you know, intent uh, of the framers. And uh, I, I, that's where I like to start, frankly, because unlike it giving an answer to some, I think it does ask us to pose some questions. And amongst those questions is whether these four million black males, in fact, are an underclass that in every way, shape, and form in the 21st century is as bad as involuntary servitude and slavery. So let's go to the root, the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery and involuntary servitude, except in the instance where you were duly convicted of a crime. After all, your involuntary servitude means you're gonna serve time. So how could it be that I could be sitting here today and say, look, the clear language of that is in a conviction of a crime is, a, is an exception. Well, fortunately, the Congress, that was passed and ratified in uh, 1865, and the Congress in 1865 in December passed the first Civil Rights Act, and I'm just going to read you what it says in pertinent part relating to crimes. Because you can imagine that if uh, a, a government wished to and you ended slavery, it'd be very easy to have a vagrancy law and somebody be thrown in jail because they don't have work. And here's what it says in pertinent part. 
All persons within the jurisdiction of the United States, one, shall have the same right in every state to the full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of persons and property as is enjoyed by white citizens. So the first thing is you got to have law and you got to have security. And if you're a freed slave, a freedman, you have the same right to that security and a person and property as a white person. And here's the second part. And shall be subject to like punishment, pains, penalties, taxes, licenses, licenses and exactions of every kind and to no other. So they were very worried in the year of the ratification of the 13th Amendment that the law could be used in a way that the newly freed slaves essentially were going to be subjected again to a peonage of some sort or a badging of incident and slavery, and they passed this specific provision. So how does that apply today, lo these many years later? Well, first I'd like to look at the facts with you. The rate of usage of illegal drugs by black and white males is and has been the same since the war on drugs began in 1980. So no matter how many people have been thrown in jail, no matter what's been done on this war in drugs, it has had no differential impact on usage by race. They've been the same throughout this period of time. Over this period of time, however, black men have been six times more likely than white men to be convicted of felonies for possession or use of illegal drugs. And since 1970, 70% of the growth in our prison population from less than 500,000 to over 2 million has been for use and possession of drugs. And most of that has been for use and possession of marijuana. The vast majority of this has been for use and possession of marijuana, not for delivering it, distributing it, selling it, promoting it, and I reminded last night for all of us who had the good fortune uh, to be a participant in that panel when the question was asked, well, is cannabis a possible help to people who have Parkinson's? And there was Evan Maurer who took out his pipe and lit it up. I'm not saying anything about where, whether marijuana is good or bad. I'm merely saying to you that the differential rates of punishment for use and the way the law has worked to give two-year minimums for just use or possession, both nationally and in states all over the, federally and all states all over the country, and for two or more, you get 20 years or life imprisonment. That's what's led to the huge increase in our prison population. But for purposes of this, six times the number of black men, over four million today, who have been in prison they basically are denied the rights to vote. They have no ability to even get uh, student aid on, under the federal statutes. They can't get into public housing. Uh, they can't get into private housing. Uh, they can't even qualify for food stamps because they're in a lifetime of parole and probation that doesn't end. So I'm merely posing the question and the hardest one, I think, under this understanding of the 13th Amendment and the 1866 Civil Rights Act, is this a caste system? And if you happen to think the answer is yes, here's where I differ from most. I don't think you end it by saying it's just a racial wrong. In fact, I think you end it by getting the vast majority of the American people to understand it's just plain dumb. It's stupid. And to think that all of the Hispanics and whites who get dragged into the system, the rates aren't as high, aren't hurt, they're hurt too. And I'm wondering how we get rid of it. And so I think the answer is get rid of minimum mandatory sentences and have maximum two to four day sentences for possession and use. And you're going to see this happening in white communities all over America because the latest academic, the one that's killing people, is opiates and fentanyl laced, excuse me, heroin laced with fentanyl. 28,000 people died last year of this. EMS services now have a 
needle that they stick in you to wake every one of these people up. And are we going to throw every one of them in jail because we happen to wake them up when they got addicted this way? I don't think so. And we don't always have to hit the nail with a criminal head when we have a problem. Let's take smoking of cigarettes. 48% of Americans smoked when we were in college. Our rates of smoking were that high. Today in America, it's less than 17%. In colleges, this college, all colleges, smoking of cigarettes is below 13%. And how did we do that? It wasn't by throwing people in jail for cigarettes. So whether you agree with me or not that this is a part of the caste system, it is stupid. And that's how I think we'll end this system that has led to four million black males essentially under a lifetime of peonage, in my opinion, direct violation, but I pose it to you as a question, of the 1866 Civil Rights Act. Thank you, Paul. Our last panelist is Catherine Epstein. She's uh, been at Amherst uh, since 2000 and been the dean of faculty for two years now. And she's going to uh, bring this worldly issue right down to Amherst. And uh, take it away. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to begin with a short anecdote. So shortly before he was shot, Martha Luther King received a letter from a young man who was eager to increase the number of black and Puerto Rican students at predominantly white liberal arts colleges. The author suggested the following steps. A, holding a conference supported by several small colleges for high school students from minority groups, explaining and showing them the opportunities available. B, summer tutoring institutes on white campuses for students in 10th and 11th grades. C, running features articles in major magazines on the life of the black student on white campuses. And D, inviting guidance counselors from large urban high schools to college campuses to impress upon them the college's desire to have more black applicants. It's the end of the quote, and the author of these words was none other than Samuel G. Jackson, Jr., the chair of our panel. <laughs> so in the 50 years since Sam's class of 1966 graduated, Amherst has made considerable progress in terms of bringing students of color to the college. Sam's suggestions were absolutely prescient. Today, though, we not only use his proposed methods, but many others to aggressively recruit black, Latino, and other underrepresented minorities to the college. We send admission staff to high schools that serve underrepresented minorities. We invite promising students to um, Amherst for diversity open houses called DEVOs. We participate in QuestBridge, a program that identifies talented low-income students and we do many other things. Today, our numbers are quite remarkable for an elite institution. 44% of our domestic students self-identify as students of color. 13% are Hispanic Latino, 12% are black, 14% Asian American, and 5% bi or multiracial. Our previous president, Tony Marks, led the way in diversifying our student body. And there's no question that Amherst has done a terrific job in bringing a diverse student body to campus. But many would argue that we have been somewhat less successful in creating a community in which all students feel welcome and thus ready to thrive in our classrooms. In some ways, then, we are a fragmented community. So I don't have much time, but I want to outline some of our main challenges and then give a few examples of what we are trying to do here. So while we have a very diverse student body, we have a much less diverse faculty. Imagine always being taught by someone who looked different than yourself. We are working hard on diversifying the faculty, but this remains slow and hard work. And moreover, in pursuing this goal, we will not compromise on the quality of our faculty. So we remain very, very careful about who we hire. But within that, we do want to diversify um, as much as possible. 
All right, the faculty that we have um, when Tony Marks was president was not um, prepared necessarily to teach our diverse student body. Every year, our student body is stronger against any standard measure. SAT or ACT scores, all of those scores have only been going up. Still, we are now asking faculty members to teach students with a range of preparations as well as a range of learning styles. You can turn over a student body in four years, but it takes a generation to turn over the faculty. <laughs> our faculty members are amazingly dedicated to our students, but we need to help them address these challenges. So what we're doing is putting in place pedagogical support so that faculty members can adopt more engaged learning techniques. Research shows that teaching methods designed to help underrepresented students actually help all students to learn and thrive in an academically rigorous environment. So while we put some of these measures in place in order to help some of our less prepared students, what we know is that all these measures help all of our students, and that's an important point to emphasize. Among other initiatives, we have also launched a teaching and learning collaborative that will coordinate our instructional staff in various ways to best support our faculty. What else are we doing? We're also working on getting departments to restructure their curricula in ways that will allow students to better work through gateway classes, those classes that are the gateways for further work in a given field. Right now, students with all levels of preparation are often in the same classes and taught in the same ways. But some students we know need more help in particular ways and also learn in different ways. Again, I want to emphasize that this is not about dumbing down the curriculum. There's absolutely no reason to do that. Our students are extremely smart and talented. But we do need to make all of our courses accessible to all of our students. So to this end, the college has secured a $1.5 million grant from the Mellon Foundation that will allow us to incentivize faculty to rethink the core courses in their majors. Uh, another issue, another um, ongoing work right now is um, we have a curriculum committee looking at the curriculum. There is a sense that we will not overcome our fragmented student body unless we create common intellectual experiences. I don't think there's a chance that we will return to the new curriculum of 1947 to 1966, but the committee will <laughs> likely recommend more structure for the first two years of study at Amherst. This could, for example, take the form... <laughs> So what might this look like? This might look like, for example, um, a three semester sequence that would focus on different skills that we deem critical for liberal arts graduates. Um, so again, we would focus on different skills in each of these um, seminars, but everyone would take them and you would probably go through in cohorts of 15 all the way through the first um, three semesters. In addition, the curriculum committee is also looking at um, recommending incentivizing students to take courses widely across the curriculum. So right now we often have a situation where in fact the very strongest students take courses in the smallest number of departments. Okay, a couple of other things. Um, I'm Dean of the Faculty, but let me just say a couple of words about what the Office of Student Affairs is doing. It's um, coming up with ways to help underrepresented students, of course, as well. Some of the things that they are doing is making the three resource centers on campus more vibrant, the Multicultural Center, the Women's and Gender Study, and the L LGBTQT Center. We're also very interested in hiring counselors of color at our counseling center. Finally, we're actually really working hard on creating more, stu more opportunities for students simply to have fun on campus, and ideally to have fun together. So the new powerhouse is an excellent example of a new approach to social life on campus. We um, are really working hard to create an inviting environment where students will want to be. So it is my hope that these and other measures will allow Amherst to become the intellectual community that we want it to be. We have long been known for our academic excellence and rigor. That will stay but we also want to benefit from the diversity that we have on campus and to build community around shared intellectual experiences. I look forward to working with the faculty to achieve what I suspect Sam really wanted so long ago, not just to have students of color on campus, 
but to ensure that students of color feel that Amherst is their Amherst, that they belong here, and that they are truly valued here. Thank you. I now uh, invite questions from the audience. Could you say something about these teaching techniques that you say are appropriate for so kinds of um, some some of you may know about flipped classrooms where professors give lectures and they are online and then in class students spend time working in small groups often on solving problems so that would be a really good example of the kinds of techniques we want faculty to adopt basically anything you can do to get students involved during class time doing active learning that helps not only underprepared students, um, but all students. And so that's why we find these methods so attractive. Yes. My name's Tuesday, and I've stayed for the past 50 years. I think everyone agrees that's spectacular success dealing with uh, racism and discrimination. And uh, the United States Armed Forces over the past 50 years, where they <coughs> approached the beginning of the policy treating absolutely everybody absolutely equally and not making allowances for from whence you came. Uh, I was wondering whether you in the academic world uh, and your respective worlds think there might be something for Amherst College and other institutions in our society to learn from them because they have quite a bit of success over the years with uh, the issue you're talking about. So it's an interesting idea. I mean, what's, what's particularly interesting there is all those students have a joint mission that they're working on together to prepare them, right, for the armed forces, if I understand this correctly. So it's that sort of thing that we sort of want to get all our students on board for liberal arts and sort of passionate about learning. It's sort of, but it's a harder message to, to form than the US military. So in some ways, they have an easier job. That said, I don't think anyone here has looked specifically at those institutions, and I'm sure it's, it's a good idea to do, um, but it's, it's a different environment. So it's, it's a good idea. Yes. Uh, this is to uh, Paul Diamond. Um, your statement that uh, the changes will come because people will realize that it's just stupid the way it is, um, I, I agree with um, but I think that the question of why, what stops us from seeing how true it is, uh, is the issue of racism. Um, you know, let's talk about that in an internal way, that these are attitudes based on, on fear of other people, by people holding fear. And how do we um, get to the point that those attitudes can soften up so that people can see how stupid it is? <laughs> well, in fact, that's where you, when I said I take a little different point of view about how to get achieve reform, you and I kind of are on the different sides of this. And the reason I say that is um, white society in general or affluent society or at least society that doesn't have uh, many persons of color has already made the decision with respect to marijuana not to enforce very much, certainly not for possession and use. And that's why I think this issue of fentanyl and heroin um, and the painkillers, where 28,000 people have died, I think is the way it can shine a light. Because I think it's very hard to achieve a goal where you want to achieve overall reform. And unfortunately, for better or worse, I've even lost by one vote in our supposed, supposed sanctimony or sanctuary of the Supreme Court. And that was in 1974, so I've been recovering ever since. <laughs> but I do think more often than not, in addition to whatever you're going to do that your approach would do, I think you need to make it an issue that you see how it's also sensible for everybody else in the society. And it, the shame is, therefore, if you see this happening in fentanyl and heroin, you, and you know whatever marijuana's bad ill effects may be, and there may be many, we handled it differently with smoking. And we're not gonna throw people in jail to say, stop doing it. It just, you know, that's how I think we're more likely, and this is, in some sense, we'll see. 
because I do not think it will survive this war on drugs. You see it now. It's falling apart in the Republican and the Democratic parties. Beware of bipartisanship. It was a bipartisan policy of the country. And it's falling apart on both Republicans and Democrats that this no longer makes sense. So I think, in fact, I'm, we could come back in five years, and I think, in fact, you'll see major reform in this, issue, this area, whatever the party in power in either the federal government or in the states. Way in the back. This is a question for Ted Rosengart. Ted, Al Meisinger. Long time no see. <laughs> Love you, man. Uh, Here's the question. Uh, in this era where people like yourselves and other people on the panel are trying to uh, destroy and eradicate racism through education and other methods, I would like you to comment on the other side, the forces which, due to free oil wars, and various other problems in the world, increase and re-inculcate new forms of racism, anti-Muslim ideology, the breakup of Yugoslavia, uh, the Ukraine situation. How do you think those forces are arrayed against the other forces, and which side do you think has a better chance of winning? Ooh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and the other kinds of discrimination and inequality. But at the same time in our world, we're facing other kinds of forces, maybe operated by greed, by world control, oil wars, different forms of imperial exploitation, such as Ukraine, such as the Kosovo, such as, uh, such as the Rwanda war, such as the anti-Muslim racism being promulgated by some politicians here, and so on. What, which of these sides do you think has a better chance of winning, and what, do you, what is your hope for the future? Thank you, Ted. I, um, I have a, uh, you know, I work uh, primarily with um, high school students and undergraduates and abroad with undergraduates in the United States and, and abroad in Poland and in Ukraine. I, I, I have tremendous hope in, in young people. I find. In, in general, of course, people of one generation have more in common with the people of that generation across the world than you do with their elders. Um, in a place like Ukraine, uh, young, say, graduates, of, uh, young high school graduates, um, don't believe a thing that their parents or grandparents tell them about the past. Uh, they are hungry to know. Uh, and. In, in a very small way, because I, I mean, I got going with the very few people I have to give to tools to learn about their history and to enable people to feel that the paths that are set out for them have not already been determined, that they can, in fact, be you know, agents of change as well. And there are uh, groups of people all over the United States, groups of young people, and groups of people all over places I visit and teach, who are coming to learn that. And the struggle, Albert, will never be won. And one of these, you know, the great struggle, we, we can't expect to see it won in lifetimes, but we are responsible to take part in it. Um, you know, I have, a, I have just a great of uh, faith and optimism uh, in, young, in the community where my children were born and raised. Um, many of the kinds of problems that I've talked about off the panel here is terrific problems with drugs, the dropouts from schools. And many of the kids at 18, 19, to, 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 to about 24, 25, get in all kinds of trouble, all kinds of tangles, don't find their way. 
But any time we can relate this if there is a pain exercise file. They don't make it, it doesn't happen this early. It happens um, for people of race and class. Uh, but it happens. Um, and uh, one of the uh, tasks that I see ahead, numbers of young people who are friends of mine, children growing up, now have records, uh, felony records. And it's these are people who served their time for petty crime, for the kind of for marijuana crime, and are ready and able to make some contribution to their communities, to their country, and are prevented from doing that. And so we have a role, I think, in uh, of any disability that's placed people did not have the advantage that our children had. At, as late teenagers in their early 20s. But I'm, you know, I, I have to say travel makes me optimistic, not uh, pessimistic. Um, even in a country like Poland, if someone were to ask you which country in Europe sends the highest proportion of its high school graduates on for world education, the answer is Poland, you would have thought. Uh, and in Ukraine, there are tremendous local movements in district by district to reform schools and to put um, children first and not ideology first. That's the wrong way to answer how to say The only answer is work. Hard work, our part, and, uh, um, and, and intimacy. And what I mean by intimacy is by being close to the problem, is by being into the communities. That uh, in which we like to see change. Thank you. Um, I think we'll have to call it a day. <laughs> Thank you.